Yum! Cardboard. Hey everyone and welcome back. I hope you've been enjoying this series on my making my giant board game and potential making it into a game show. Plus hearing my rants about uh, random things that affect us in life. In this video, I'm going to finish up making up the modular game spaces by gluing the actual graphics onto cardboard, cutting them out, and then applying them to each and every playing space based on the color scheme that we talked about in the previous video. And as for my next life rant, uh, we're going to talk about is uh, the idea of leadership in business, mostly managers and supervisors, the difference between exceptional ones and the worst dictator-like ones. Uh, now that we're all laid off, I think this is a great opportunity to really have this discussion about the type of people we've worked for, plus the type of leaders we want to be. But anyways, I won't uh, hesitate uh, for too long. Let's get it started and really get closer to getting this game done. Thanks for watching. Let's go. The first thing I want to do is glue down all the space graphics on cardboard. I could glue them down flat on the actual playing spaces, but I want the image to pop up a little bit from the space. This is just a personal preference. Using my backyard and my spray glue, I mask up and spray like a madman on the back of each space's graphic. This is pretty much straightforward in the process of me going in and out of my house to spray glue the back of the images and then head inside to carefully lay down the images on the cardboard. I do this over and over until all the graphics are laid down flat. Then, using my weights, I stack the sheets of glued images and compress them for about eight hours to ensure the glue settles for the next stage of cutting. Here on out, you will see the hyperlapse video of me cutting each cardboard backed graphic out and then using construction grade glue to carefully affix them to their corresponding spaces based on the color selection I showed in a previous video. And while that's going on, let's talk about supervisors and the idea of good versus lackluster leadership. With so many of us laid off, I think now is the perfect time to discuss the attributes that make up exceptional, standard, and frankly pathetic leaders at work. I want to talk about this because of my own work experiences. I have worked many, many jobs in my 43 years of life, and I have seen the full gambit. I have worked with a small handful of inspirational leaders, and also a handful of horrible leaders who get drunk off their so-called quote-unquote power. Most of my bosses were average. I wasn't inspired by them, but I wasn't annoyed by them either. They simply did their jobs as I did mine. Prior to 2008, the financial collapse, back when the economy was seemed unstoppable and just going through new heights, I was what I called a forever contractor and temp. I would jump from job to job placement because there, at the time, the jobs were plentiful and I wanted to be my own boss, so I didn't want to commit to any one job. Jobs were just a way for me to pay the bills as I tried to do my own personal endeavors. One of those placements, which I worked at for about six years on and off, was at a national retailer's distribution warehouse within the conveyor operations. The conveyors are the circulatory system of the warehouse that transports goods to every corner of the place. It was an easy job, yet very boring at times. But the one reason why I truly enjoyed working there was because of my boss, Frank. Frank, to me, is the exceptional standard I want to be at as a leader when I have employees when I'm able to grow my publishing business and hopefully get it running after this COVID-19 madness ends. Of all the bosses I've ever had, going back to the age of 16, Frank is the gold standard. Let me explain why, and I'll start off with this one experience. Due to the expansive size of the conveyor lines that crisscross the massive warehouse, it was easy for many sections to be overlooked for cleaning, and in time, key parts of the conveyor system got dusty and gross due to product spills and the grease needed to keep the parts lubricated. I was still pretty new at the position as a conveyor helper, I think just two months in, when I was told that on my next shift, I would be helping to clean the conveyors, probably one of the worst parts of the job. Helpers have actually quit because of these periodic cleanings. And they were bad, especially during the summertime when in that warehouse it was like an oven. The day of the cleaning, as I walked in dreading to have someone standing over me while I scrubbed and scraped off dirty machinery, I saw Frank walking towards me and my fellow helpers covered in grease and soot. He was dirty as hell. Although I met him a few times at the beginning of that job, 
I already knew Frank was one of the big bosses, one of the head honchos at the warehouse, and he didn't have to do any physical labor if he didn't want to. I assumed he was just going to be there to bark orders like any head honcho. But no, that wasn't Frank's style. With his white dress shirt stained to hell, Frank was there with his underlings doing the exact same work. He didn't have to do it. He wanted to do it. He explained that he would never ask any of his workers to do something he himself would not do. This was my first time working with a high-ranking boss doing the same grimy work as his subordinates. You were assigned a task, a time frame. He trusted you to do what was needed without supervision. At the end of the shift, he got everyone together and thanked everyone for their efforts. That was the day I realized I was working with a real leader. Over those six years, Frank always showed me and fellow staff why he was an exceptional boss. Here's examples. He always showed gratitude for hard work. If you did what was basically required for the job, aka the bare minimum, that was fine and not a problem. But if you went above and beyond, he always took notice. He didn't take your extra work and effort for granted. And as a group, if we met or surpassed expectations, he would get us all together and thanked us. If he looked good to the higher ups, it was only because of the work that we did. That meant a lot to all of us workers when you are acknowledged for what you do. Two, if you screwed up on the job and made mistakes, instead of being passive aggressive or just doling out punishments, Frank would talk to you privately to see what was wrong and discuss how to improve things. There was always a talk prior to corrective action. This helped employees vent their concerns or frustrations to a boss who actually listened. Three, Frank actually cared about your life outside of work. He would ask you how you're doing, how's the family doing. If you had kids, like many of my coworkers did, he would ask how they were doing. He knew all their names. Four, if you didn't have lunch or was low on cash for the bus or gas, Frank would lend you the money. Now, he did expect that money back ASAP and he expected you to repay it. But you knew if you were down on your luck for a while before you got paid, you knew he had your back. When my contract finally came to an end, he came to talk to me and thank me for the work I did over the years. Again, showing appreciation for those who helped his division and helped him look good. I could give you other examples of his type of leadership, but I think you get the point. It is no wonder that years after leaving the job, I still call Frank to say hello, and he calls me sometimes as well. Other former employees keep in touch with him as well. As I mentioned before, to me, there are three basic types of leaders slash manager slash supervisors. There is the exceptional coach, the standard bearer, and the pathetic dictator. Exceptional coach bosses are those who truly inspire their staff to be the best of the best. Like Frank, these leaders achieve respect from their employees because their employees feel needed and appreciated. The paycheck isn't what keeps the staff around. It's the leader's attitude that does. They are truly like coaches bringing their team to a championship in any sport. Then there's the standard bearer bosses, who are the ones who are not amazing, they're not horrible. They do what is required of them, just like their employees do what is required of them. They're just middle of the road bosses, and there's nothing wrong with that. And then there are the pathetic dictator types. These are the ones who see their staff as simply parts in a machine. This boss's personal performance means everything, and you are merely a tool to help them achieve their short-sighted goals. They lack people skills. They are selfish and show blatant favoritism. They act like petty dictators that expect loyalty regardless of what they do or don't do. This type of leader doesn't have to be bombastic or outlandish like the stereotypical dictators of a country. He or she is a dictator in spirit, in the sense that they are never wrong, what they say goes, even if it doesn't make sense, and you as an employee are disposable and they make sure you know that. The threat of losing your paycheck is what they dangle in front of you to get blind loyalty. I'm sure many of you have worked with a boss that's like this. I've had to work for a supervisor who is the poster child, in my opinion, as the pathetic dictator of variety. A supervisor so bad, many, many of my previous coworkers quit purely because of him, and many of our customers and clients would complain about him chronically. I was on the verge of quitting myself. Now, I stayed in the job because one, it paid well, I had seniority, I got along well with the bosses above him, the higher ups, my coworkers and clients. Dealing with this one supervisor wasn't worth quitting, but many shifts did push me to the edge. 
Here are some examples of how this type of leader spoils a decent job. He or she lies constantly to ensure their mistakes are covered up. He or she will not only lie to you, but also to their higher ups and to clients. He or she takes credit for your work and doesn't inform others of your input achievements and ideas. He or she never concedes on making mistakes and will try to throw other employees under the bus for his or her failings. He or she shows blatant favoritism to specific employees or a group of employees within a certain racial, gender, or ethnic group. He or she brings their personal issues and demons to work and takes out their frustrations on their subordinates. He or she seems to always screw up on recording your worked hours if you're a wage employee and almost always underreports those hours when it happens. He or she doesn't ask your permission for things you are not required to provide for your job. Here's an example. Fellow workers need a ride to work or to a job site, and instead of asking you if you could do that favor in your personal vehicle, you are told to do it. He or she purposely speaks in another language to certain employees in front of you constantly, and that's just rude and disrespectful. He or she tries to pull scams by getting you to pay for items that the office should pay for, or to sign for rental or leased equipment using the employee's license, not the license of the actual supervisor. And he or she ignores his or her boss's instructions to do whatever he or she wants, and you as the employee are caught in the middle, are caught in the contradiction of the two levels. As I stated before, I didn't end up quitting that job due to working for a supervisor like this, but my work ethic did diminish. My desire to go above and beyond became non-existent. It was the same for many other employees. I'm no longer with that company now for other reasons, but I do not miss working for that supervisor. But the one positive, the caveat I will take away from my experiences with this person is that I now know what type of leader not to be. If I get to the point of hiring supervisors to work for me, I now have a checklist of attributes to keep an eye out for. And if I do get another job, I won't stay at a company if I'm required to work with someone who has these kind of attitudes. You got to live and learn. Okay, with that said and my rant done, back to the type of work that brings me joy and purpose. The game board is almost complete and stacked to dry. Really, this game is pretty much done. The next video will show the extra pieces I've added in to enhance the gameplay as well as the accessories like the dice and game cards. But I'm very excited we're getting close to testing this game out. Thanks for watching and I hope wherever you work or wherever you're going to return to work, you're in an environment that nurtures your talents and appreciates what you bring to the table. That you have bosses who truly inspire you to be better. If not, now is the time to shop around for another option. You deserve to be appreciated. Cheers. Talk to you again. And I hope you enjoy me for the next video in the series.